everybody, Rossio from Cinema Viva Tech Talks, back at it again here with Stuart of Black Magic Design. How's it going, Stuart? Really good, really good, thank you. Great day. I bet. It's been a long day. We have walked all the way from the hotel to here, all around the booths like three or four times. We've talked to Live View, we've talked to Canon, and now we're here with Black Magic. I saw this morning on the Facebook that you guys had introduced some new switchers, is that right? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, some great announcements at the show this year. I think, um, you know, people are I've not seen this for a couple of years. They're interested in what's been going on. And, um, you know, this is a great opportunity to showcase some new ATEM switches, new ATEM constellations. Uh, we have effectively um, two different models there of the ATEM, sorry, three different models of the ATEM constellation, um, all HD models. Um, people familiar with our constellations will know we have an 8K version. Um, but what we're starting to look at is how we can transition some of those ATEM mini users um, through to uh, SDI based products. So um, starting with effectively a 10 input um, HD constellation with six auxiliary outputs. Um, that's our first model. And then we have a second model which uh, doubles everything. So effectively 20 inputs and 12 outputs. And then finally we have a 4ME version which is gonna be 40 inputs and uh, it's gonna be 24 outputs. So all the inputs and outputs that you need. That's insane, that's insane. What would I need 40 inputs for? Well, you might have a lot of cameras, you might have a lot of, uh, a lot of different decks and devices. I mean, really this is about giving people flexibility. Um, you know, we talk about scalability, we talk about the fact that more and more people are, are using more and more camera, creative camera ang angles, um, obviously playing lots of different sources in. So really this gives you some flexibility that maybe you thought you didn't need, but you never know, six months down the line, you might need those inputs. That's great. Well, I've been looking for something to replace my ATEM TVS HD, and it looks like you just came out with one. It's uh, which one? This one. Yeah. So, so this is the the the, the first of the, the, of the new switches. Yeah, that's right. So, effectively, it's a two-thirds rack unit, um, and we've got the ten inputs on there, and as I say, we've got the um, the six auxiliary outputs. What that means is that you can effectively route those six outputs wherever you want them to go, um, which gives you ultimate flexibility. I think. One of the key bits of feedback that we've had around all of our switches is give us more auxiliary outputs because people either want to send them to multiple screens or they want to send them to multiple decks. Um, and um, we try to get as many as we can on that device. And, and, this, is, and this, is, you know, this is a great new product. Certainly if you're coming from um, maybe HDMI or the TVS, um, you told me before about the television studio. I mean, it's a product we've had around now for a few years. Um, and this is, a, this is a, a nice step up from that. You know, the TVS is really loud. Let's see how this is. Pretty quiet. Yeah, it's whispering. It's whispering. Oh, man. I mean, I have to put my TVS in like a box with <laughs> a foam casing and stuff. No, just kidding. But uh, yeah, that's great. Um, and with the six auxiliary outputs, uh, that would allow you to do like ISOs if you ran each one into like a hyperdeck or something? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it gives you the, the, the flexibility there to take all your ISO feeds out or, or run your program out to, to multiple screens. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we tried to keep this as, as flexible as possible. That's great. And what about the next one up in the series? Okay, so um, the easiest way to, to look at this is it's, it's this unit here. It's effectively still, um, uh, it's one rack unit width, um, but it's 20 inputs and it is 12 outputs. So you've got 12 auxiliary outputs now. And is all that SDI or does it have HDMI too? It's, it's all SDI, it's all SDI. So, so these are all SDI base units. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so it's, you're getting high quality HD video um, across SDI connectivity. Okay, fantastic. And then this is the big one, huh? Yeah, so, so now we're stepping up to the, what is the 4ME version of it. So we're now talking 40 inputs and we're talking 24 outputs. Um, you know, what you, can, you can kind of see here on the wall behind me. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking, um, you know, a product that has got a lot of features in there. It's got um, media players built in. It's got, it's got four DVEs in there as well. So, you know, we're, we're, we're loading this now with tech. You know, this is... Um, this is a significantly, um, a significant and powerful unit that gives you um, things like Super Source, which obviously is something that more and more people are using now. Love the Super Source. Yeah, you've got. I, I want to say you've got something like, uh, um, I think it's like animated frames, 200 animated frames on there as well. So, you know, it's got a lot of features built in, um, and we're talking now about a HD switcher that is broadcast quality. You know, we're giving high broadcast quality for HD for HD prices. Well, great. I can't wait to buy one. Can I take one home today? Um, you can try and wrestle this one out of this cabinet and take it, but I don't think it'll fit in your pocket. 
Uh, and then but down here, you've got the um, the Hyperdeck Extremes. Is that what that is? Yeah, so the, these are the Hyperdeck 12Gs. I mean, this is a product line that we've had going now for a, for a short while, part of the Hyperdeck, the Hyperdeck range. Um, what we have announced at the show is the new Hyperdeck Extreme um, 4K HDR. So again, we had an 8K version of that. We've now tried to um, develop and engineer a 4K version, um, which means that you're getting 4K capability, but you're also getting all of those extreme features that you would have seen on the on the 8K version. Um, HDMI connectivity, sorry, SDI connectivity, um, op option to put a cache in there as well, which you know is a, is a is a great feature for those people who are trying to record onto a cache. Oh. Um Enlighten me. What would the cache help out to do? Okay, so um, let's let's look at say the new um, cloud functionality that we've got. We've announced some cloud products, and you want to offload um, high um, resolution um, footage from that. What you can actually do is you can actually pass that through the cache, so that effectively um, it's been able to keep up the speed of high resolution. So we're talking about um, a processing function within that unit for um, for high resolution capture. Oh, okay, that's fantastic. And would that uh, help to like? Um Instant replay? Um, it, 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 I believe it's got some of the uh, functionality in there that you can actually play directly from that cache. So effectively, if you're outputting, you can use that to um, to, to effectively um, slow down, play down, play out a, um, a partial um, amount of video from something that's pre-recorded. So yeah, it's, it's almost like a, a replay function in there, but it's, um, it's not full instant replay. Okay, well that would be fantastic. I'd love to delve more into that. But tell me a little bit more about uh, the cloud servers and stuff that you have now, because I think that's going to change my post-production workflow. Yeah, so so obviously with Resolve, we've we've it's been a product now that really is being utilized across many, many different types of users. We're talking a wide demographic of, of users from individual YouTube cre um, content creators all the way through to high-end feature film and all of those people in the middle. And I think that um, by having a tool like Resolve 18 that is um, suitable for everybody. What we want to try and do is look at how we can knit people together. I think it's important now in, a, in, in today's world and in the future world that collaborative workflow is something that more and more people want to do. So if you're located in New Jersey and you've got editors that are based in California, um, you want to be able to work with that person seamlessly. You want to be able to share projects. You want to be able to share media. Um, and really this new Blackmagic Cloud um, uh, that we're offering really truly gives you true, true collaboration. There's essentially two parts to this. The first part is the sharing of a library and projects, and then the second part is the sharing of the media. So with Blackmagic Cloud, you effectively pay um, a $5 fee, to $5 a month to host a library. Now that library is created from within Resolve 18, and you can have multiple projects within that, within that library. Um, that means that if I'm the person administering that library, I can invite other people in to come and use my, uh, to access that library to work on my projects. Now that gives me as the administer, as administrator the right to give you read write or just read, um, or just read um, preferences. Um, but, but what it also does is it means that those individual clients, as many of them as I want working on it, are not actually paying themselves. It's only me as the host uh, of that library that's paying that $5. Now after two weeks, if I decide that I want to finish that library and I want to shut that project down, I can effectively remove that library from the cloud and I'll stop being charged. So this is not a subscription. It's not something that rolls month on month. It's not something where you've got a 30 day window where you have to continue before you can cancel. Effectively, this means that if that library is active, you're being charged. If you're that library is not active, effectively you're not being charged. Great, and how does uh, sharing the media work? Okay, I'm glad you asked that because that's the secondary part now. So um, if you are um, working within that cloud environment and you already have a copy of that media, say locally, um, uh, local to you, then obviously you can, um, you can reconnect that to your project. But in most cases, what we want to do is synchronize media and we want to be able to add and subtract media from a shared, shared point. We also want to be able to make adjustments and changes and for me as the administer, administrator to see those changes happen real time. So what we um, can do with our cloud store products is that we can take our hardware device. We have a cloud store, we have a, we have a pod. We also have a cloud store mini. 
and we have the cloud store 20 terabyte and the cloud store um, 80 terabyte. Um, and those are effectively hardware devices that, um, that host our media. What we now do is we link them to a central Dropbox client. Now, with that Dropbox, I can then give you rights to that Dropbox account. And if you also have a cloud store at your end, as I am populating my media at my end, what's happening is that media is transferring up to that Dropbox account, and it's then transferring down onto your local storage. So now any changes and additions that I'm making, we're, we're real-time synchronizing all of that together. So as I make a change, you will, make, you will see that change. Now, because we're using 10 gig Ethernet, and we're using a Dropbox client, which is in incredibly fast, um, all of those additions and all of those changes are happening very, very quickly, which means that we can work with, um, with high resolution media, we can, we can work with effectively storage intensive media, um, and the nice thing about the way in which this is all synchronized is that this will just um, pass, its, or pass up through that Dropbox and drop back down into your device. Um, and you won't have to necessarily be waiting for a significant amount of time for you to get access. So you're not really doing proxies then, it just uh, syncs the high resolution media? Okay, so now this is the next bit. So proxies. Now, if you want to start working on that project um, immediately, before all of that footage is copied down onto your local drive, um, we've developed a new app. This new app is called the Proxy Generator. Now, what this is is an application that looks at a specific folder on that cloud store, and it reads through your folder structure to look for media that can be create, created, uh, that, can, that it can create proxies for. So as an example, let's say I've got a single folder, and in that folder I've got 10 files. They're all high resolution, they're all storage intensive. I can now point to that folder with the proxy generator. It will look at those 10 files. I can hit start, and it will start to convert all of those into proxies. Now, the benefit of it working in a way where we're pointing that, that application at those folders means that I could actually have multiple machines all pointing at that folder. So let's say in my facility, I've got five machines. We're all creating proxies together. Now, when those proxies are generated, those proxies then sit in a small folder with the master original. Now, I do have the ability within the proxy generator to extract those if I want, so I can just pull out the proxies. But the benefit is as well is that when those files are transferred up to the uh, Dropbox and then are effectively removed from Dropbox or passed down to your device, proxies are treated with preference, which means that the first thing you'll start to see before you see anything else is proxies, which means as, as an editor or as a colorist, you can now start working. And all of those changes are happening, as I say, close to real time, which means that we're now working in a very fluid environment. We're all working collaboratively together. We're all seeing these changes. And I'm able to monitor those as, a, as the administrator of, those, uh, of that project. How is this going to change the post-production game in terms of collaborating with people all around the world? Yeah, I, I think that you've got to look at the future of where we're going. I mean, we're, we're truly international and global now in terms of the way in which we work and we interact. Um, what you've got to think about is accessing the best talent. And sometimes the best talent doesn't live you know, in the same state. So that talent might be in a different state, might be in a different country altogether. Now, when you start to work within a collaborative workflow, you've got to think about, okay, it's one thing to be able to share a project, but how do I ensure that this is an efficient and speedy process? Because if you're having to send drives or if you're having to you know, kind of constantly wait for updates or wait for communication path, you know, this, this slows things down you know, and time is money and we want to try and move things quickly. So for us, it's all about making sure that we have a true collaborative workflow, but something that is, is also efficient and speedy. And I think that whether you're working within a local environment or whether you're working in a global environment, We've really tried to attend to this with the Blackmagic Cloud. Yeah, and I guess an added benefit would be it's kind of a backup system in a way, right? Like your footage is could be somewhere in another part of the world too. Yeah, and I and I think that you know this this is all about you know we've developed redundancy obviously within the cloud store, um, which is you know everything's RAID five, so you've got backups within there. You can also offload your media from that in store and have a backup directly connected to that cloud store. Um, you know, obviously you could use in Dropbox's account, Dropbox account, and um, I believe within Dropbox there is also, um, you know, some file recovery within Dropbox. So yeah, I mean, this is, a, this, it has to be secure. It has to allow you to move media around and have the, the comfort in knowing that 
what's going to happen is is not going to be derogatory or, 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 or cause problems to your, your project. Absolutely. It seems like a very safe and secure method as well as fast and hopefully simple. Yeah, well, I think I think simplicity is key. I mean, Black Magic as a company, we've always tried to ensure that we we keep things straightforward and easy to understand. Um, and I think that, you know, Resolve has got to a point now where at Resolve 18, um, you know, this is a seriously complex tool. Um, but I think that people are growing with it and people are working with it and exploring with it. And I think that this is a very, um, you know, a very easy step to make now when you start to work with cloud. And I, I'm already looking at some of the feedback that we're getting at the show and online. Um, and people are, seem to be really happy about this. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us about all this, Stuart. Are you going to be at the party later tonight? Oh, I'm not sure about that. It's a busy week. I'm probably going to be, uh, I'm probably going to be feet up, um, maybe a cool drink, and, uh, and maybe an early night. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, take it easy, man. I think we still have enough energy to make it to the party. And uh, this is our last interview today. So thank you, everybody. I wish I could be here the rest of the week, but I've got to go back to San Diego and shoot some more videos in our beautiful studio. And we will catch you later online or outside. Once again, I'm Marasio Jones with Cinema Viva Tech Talks. Have a great one.